Welcome to Pieces of China, which tells the story of China one object at a time. I'm Dinda Elliott. I'm the Director of Programs at China Institute, and we are so honored today to have with us Janet Yang, a Golden Globe and Emmy Award winning Hollywood producer who sits on the Board of Governors for the Motion Picture Academy. Um, Yang's film and, and television credits include The Joy Luck Club, The People vs. Larry Flint, Shanghai Calling, and the recent animated feature Over the Moon, as well as many, many more. Um, Yang has been named one of the 50 most powerful women in Hollywood by The Hollywood Reporter. But just one of the many reasons for that is that Janet has played an instrumental role in connecting Hollywood and China. So we're so thrilled to have her with us today. Janet, please come turn on your camera and join us. Um, and welcome, Janet. It is so great to have you. Thank you, Dinda. It's nice to be here. So, so okay, so Janet, you're a filmmaker. So why did you choose the sculpture, this sculpture, which I think you're gonna show us. Yep, there you go. The sculpture by noted artist Wang Koping as your object and how did it come into your life? Tell us a little bit about that. I'm, I'm turning it around so you can see all sides. And by the way, I just love the idea of, of your program, just finding <laughs> objects. So this sculpture was given to me by Wang Koping when I was living in China in 1980, 81. I had gotten, very lucky actually to have met very quickly uh, in this country that I knew so little about really and moved there kind of on a lark to work at the Foreign Language Press. But uh, I ended up meeting a lot of Chinese writers, artists, painters, you know, sculptors. Um, and I was so drawn to them because I had never in my experience growing up in America, met Chinese artists or cultural creators of any kind. And so it was it was kind of a game changer in my mind about, oh my God, we can do this because I felt found myself really relating to them. We could have conversations about music or about poetry or whatever. And I literally had never, I, I didn't even think it was possible for, for me to have a community of people around with whom I could discuss these things. I mean, it, it was that startling. And of course, there were a few budding filmmakers. But this particular sculpture. Yeah. So let's Wong take Koping. a look, Aaron. Let's take a look at the photograph of Wong Koping. We've got the sculpture okay. there. So, but we also, yeah. So there we, there's Wong Koping. As, on as the left. most of, yeah, Wong Koping is on the left along with other artists. Um, as you probably know the seven in is 79 that was the sort of not only the end of the cultural revolution which officially ended in 76 but as a real opening up of the Deng Xiaoping era yeah. and there was a, an incredible amount of just experimentation of like oh how far can we go to yeah. open up because there was this feeling of opening up and one of the big movements at the time that was birthed then was birthed in 79 I I encountered this group in 1980 was Xinxing Meijian is the Our stars group they called yeah. them and the they stars must say, you really jumped right into the thick of things I mean you were that right there with the really leading intellectuals and sorry yeah. to interrupt, but we just have to jump to the next photograph which is just so amazing okay so so I had, um, I, I was trying to decide whether I was going to be more Western or more China. I said, couldn't figure out what I was because uh -huh. I found uh, the few people that I knew in Beijing at the time were all from uh, the West. And, but I found I was very conspicuous if I was with them and I was being followed because they thought I was a local, uh, you know, hey, Chinese oh, citizen gosh. and yeah. I was being barred from entering the Peking hotel or the blah, blah, blah. And that, but then, so I started meeting these Chinese people, but I also found it fascinating. And my, my, you know, Caucasian friends were very envious that I got to infiltrate the Chinese you community. Bet. So I started yeah. helping organize these kind of events. It was a little racy. We didn't know, we didn't know. This is at Yuan Ming Yuan. And uh, we decided to bring a boom box and play music and invite friends and friends oh, of friends. God. And pretty soon there was a large gathering of people. <laughs> Yeah, so, tell us a little bit. Uh, I mean, the early 80s must have been so intense because of that it, moment of it was you know, just so opening up. Yeah, it was so intense, but so heady and so exciting because we didn't know what the boundaries were. There were there were very few set parameters. And so everything was like, oh, can we do this? So 
some Chinese, of course, would, would never be seen with me at all because that would be seen too, too you know, dangerous. Mm -hmm. And others went very, very far to be friendly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I guess it was writers and artists and painters. And, and then the first few filmmakers I met, not, none of which are known now. One of them was a, a, a man named Peng Ning who, who made a film called Taiyang Yuren, Son and Man. And he was the first filmmaker I met. That film, I think, was never released. It was deemed too controversial. But just this opening up, and it was so it was so exciting to be the time. Many of us who've experienced uh, China in the 80s are very nostalgic for that period because there was both an innocence and curiosity and yet this feeling of optimism because yes. it was coming out of a very dark period. So yes, yeah. yeah, so this was this was a, one of the little <laughs> dance. Yeah, amazing. Amazing. Yeah. amazing. I, I just can't believe this photograph actually. Um, but uh, so, and just a few years later, you started really meeting your first Chinese filmmakers, yes. I guess, in the, you know, beyond Peng. Um, yes. So let's well, see, I, you, here you are with, yes. with, with the foreign minister. Yeah, okay. So there's, this is slightly backwards. I wanted to say just one word about the sculpture, first of all, I, I forgot yeah. about it. Uh, as Wang Keping very uh, clearly told me, he purposely made a sculpture that had sort of one eye open and one eye closed. And that's a little bit of, that's a, that's a great summary for what we were all kind of doing at the time and how many artists live in China. It's like, okay, we, you know, it's sort of like you, you, you go forward with one eye open, one eye closed, because you're not, you're never quite sure perhaps of like if what you're doing is kosher. And I, I probably shouldn't say too much more unless I <laughs> <laughs> my foot in my mouth, yeah. but you know, it's it's you you're kind of walking this fine line, this yeah. this balancing act, and everything was like that. I mean, as an artist, your impulse is to create and push the boundaries a little bit, but of course, you want to be careful and and you know not be canceled, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this was after um, uh, okay after I came back from that period in China, I started organizing film festivals. And I was actually running a company in San Francisco called World Entertainment. We had a theater and I was actively now um, bringing Chinese films over for distribution and exhibition. So that was actually my job. And I was doing that in San Francisco for a while. And that's the period actually when I met uh, a number of the now very famous filmmakers like Chen Haigan, Zhang Yimou. Okay, Yimo, so let's, let's jump ahead. Uh, I'm so sorry. Photographs. Well, th this yeah. is, okay, this is the job that had afterwards. So World Entertainment, I guess those pictures aren't there. It doesn't matter. But I yeah. was, that's when I was, again, actively searching for Chinese films. We had a loose theater, a chain of theaters around North America. And I was doing that from about 84 to 85. And then I got hired by uh, Universal Studios to represent the studios in China in selling American films. So this actually came a little bit later. I happen to have more pictures of this period, but it yeah. was in my period running World Entertainment that I first saw uh, Chen Kaige's Yellow Earth, that yeah, I yeah. first saw, and that was actually, uh, as many of you know, the the document, the uh, cinematographer on that film was actually Zhang Yimou. Zhang Yimou and Chen Kaige had a strong partnership as a director and DP. Um, and uh, later, when I was representing Universal Studios, I I got to have more lavish <laughs> parties, and I would bring executives over and got them to reconnect with a lot of filmmakers. Yeah, so and jump, jump to the, the next photograph. This these generation next ones are so fun. Yes, so this is uh, Wu Tianming's in the middle. And, uh, and explain who his... he is. He, he, oh, he okay, so Wu Tianming, Wu Tianming was the, he ran the Xi'an Film Studio. Oh. And because Xi'an is somewhat far from Beijing, he was given a little more leeway perhaps, but he really made it a breeding ground for young filmmakers, many of whom graduated from the Beijing Film Academy, like Chen Gaga, like, uh, like uh, Zhang Mo, like to the far right is Tian Zhuang Zhuang, another filmmaker I very much yeah. admire. And a lot of, really, I think virtually all the fifth generation filmmakers came out of that Xi'an film studio. And Wu Tianming really was their godfather. He himself was a director, but he was the godfather of all these incredible filmmakers. And it was kind of heartbreaking later on that they kind of dispersed and yeah. did not have as close a relationship. You know, that's just my nostalgia. He was such but, a wonder, I remember him. He was such a wonderful man, and so brilliant and so brave. That's a and character, brave. so brave, so yeah. forthright, so outspoken. You know, it, it sometimes it takes a person like that to just break new ground and he did it. He really helped birth the, yeah. the fifth generation filmmakers that we've all grown to love so yeah. much. 
There we, I love these pictures so much. Okay, so who have we got That's, there? Yeah, Johnny Mo on the left and Chun Kaga in the middle. And uh, I think it was an exact, I can't remember who that person was, forgive me. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, there was, they were young. They were, we were all yeah. little, you know, it was the, again, this feeling, it, it was such a, a an opening and yeah, let's, let's, and, and there was such a thrill to have well, that, that period. And then, you know, I felt so lucky because I could bring a piece of Hollywood to China and the people at the studios were so lucky that I could, you know, introduce them to these great, you know, yeah. version of filmmakers. So just that was- To, to was mention, amazing. to, you know, bring back um, Yellow Earth again for a second. I mean, I remember when that first came out, it was just stunning. Like, can you say two, a few words about stunning. why that film was stunning. so important? Yeah, that, that film, I would say, and, and it's so funny, so a couple of years ago, Time Out Magazine did something about, you know, what is the single most influential Chinese film? And a number of people, including me, said Yellow Earth. I, when I saw that film, it was so startlingly beautiful, haunting, deep. Yes. Um, and it showed me that there was incredible artistry. And, you know, there are periods of time in different countries where there's very little commercial pressure, but yes. it's really about what movie can you make that has depth but and meaning but can pass censors you know and i think yellow earth represented that so there's this kind of obliqueness about the messaging but so profound so so haunting really i i think about that film till this day and i'm so you know that's when i thought i want to dedicate my life to uh Chinese cinema, or at least, you know, it's what inspired me. I thought if people in China can do this, um, it opened up my eyes again, first to just wanting people to see these images from China that I thought would change how they saw all of us from, uh, of this race, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because I, my eyes were, were opened up to that. And then if Westerners could see that, wow, it would change how they saw us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that movie led to, again, the, the running that distribution uh, you know, working at that distribution company to then work at Universal and then beyond. <laughs> so let's jump ahead. We've got some fit photographs that, that, are, that sort of show your journey very quickly. Yeah. Okay, so I so I became kind of this person that was bringing a lot of, I, yeah. I was uh, a happily being this bridge. And this is Incredible. Michael Wilson. And in the back is Barbara Broccoli. And uh, is Albert Broccoli there? So these are the producers of the James Bond movies. Right, amazing. And, um, and uh, they were taking a trip. They asked me to, you know, help shepherd them around. And yeah. they had been scouting in China. I mean, this is what's so amazing. People, you know, the 80s was a period of incredible opening. A lot of people were going. It was so new. There was such a friendly feeling because U.S.-China relations had been normalized in 79. For You know, waves of Chinese students and businessmen yeah. and journalists had finally started going over officially. So there was such a period of opening, I think. We all remember these periods uh, with great fondness. Yeah, we are yeah. not in that period right now. Yeah, um, yeah, but yeah. so, you know, introducing people to Chinese officials. But it, it's interesting that that was, you know, they, they were scouting China back then and and continue to scout <laughs> to some degree, yeah. but haven't yeah. yet done it. So this is uh, me with uh, the amazing Gregory Peck. We, we organized a, a retrospective of Gregory Peck's works. And in fact, the first film that I sold to China, the first studio film really that officially showed there was Roman Holiday. Amazing. So we organized a whole retrospective around him. We showed To Kill a Mockingbird and other things. And so this is uh, obviously- Go on to the next movie. one, yep. Um, and then, so as I'm doing, so I'm working at Universal Studios and I got a call one day from Steven Spielberg's office and they said, oh, we hear, and I literally was the only person in Hollywood that was, was very actively working in China. I yeah, mean, it was yeah. just my thing. And most Amazing. people thought it was kind Amazing. of weird and obscure and like, what the hell are you doing? And why, you know, Amazing. my own parents like, what? But it was, nobody really understood. Oh, my boss, Skip Paul, absolutely recognized the importance of China one day, but very yeah. few other people did. Anyways, yeah. I got that call and that, yeah. that call became uh, working on the movie Empire of the Sun that Steven Spielberg directed which was, uh, of course, and then just a, another life-changing moment for me. And that's when I decided, oh, I could be a producer and actually affect what's on screen. Because before I was just looking at pictures that were done mm -hmm. and, and using them as a, a way to 
to you know form a bridge so to speak yep. but now I thought oh if you get behind the camera and you can actually determine the images and the words and that's a whole other level of empowerment <laughs> these pictures are so great because they really capture a moment but okay let's go to the next one let's let's run through these um so yep. after that period working at the studios I then formed a company with Oliver Stone the direct writer director Oliver Stone and we started and you know he was um at the time uh and in some ways to list this sort of what we call an 800 pound gorilla, meaning it had a lot of influence. You could really bring a, a, a lot of um, power to a project and, and make it more likely to be greenlit. And one of the things I brought, which was uh, you know just a, a manuscript that I read at the time that was handed to me when Kathy Kennedy, Steven Spielberg's producer, brought me to New York to meet with publishers to look for projects. I was, they handed me this manuscript, just a couple of chapters actually. Incredible. Of, what, of a book that became Joy Luck Club. And that's when I said, oh my God, I went through this, met Amy. Uh, one thing I'll let you know, this is the table read we had with all the cast. Um, so we have you to thank for the fact that we saw Joy Luck Club. That's well, amazing. You know, I, I did my part, but you know, that's Wayne- That's fantastic. And, uh, and all right, Amy. let's keep going through because we got a lot of good stuff. Okay, so <laughs> sorry, I can tell you, I'm, I'm too chatty. Um, Dark Matter is another movie. You know, I was always looking, so, so trying to, you know, that was, it was 90s was not a great period between the US and China. There wasn't that much, but in the 2000s approaching the Olympics, it started opening up again. And I went over there and mm. I thought, oh my God, the whole environment in China has changed. It's time to get very, I was really pretty immersed in Hollywood from all through the 90s and in early 2000s. But then I went back, I said, there's gotta be stuff to do. So I ended up uh, producing a film called Dark Matter, which mm. actually starred the amazing Liu Ye. Um, but also uh, had Meryl Streep in it. And that was a movie that we brought to Sundance, actually won an award and, and whatnot. And we shot, uh, we shot a portion of that movie in China as well, just like a portion of Joy Luck Club was shot in China. But I started getting, you know, and I, it was such a good experience on Dark Matter. I was like, I love the crew. I love working here. This is so good. You know, there's, there's a common language in, with, among filmmakers. So then I started more actively thinking, oh, what else can I do in China? Interesting. And um, this is one of the things that I ended up doing was producing for Disney, a Chinese version of High School Musical. And Incredible. that was so fun because I got to uh, really meet all these young dancers and singers and actors from China. And, you know, we did a whole, um, you know, created these songwriters and lyricists. And that was really, really fun. It, 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 it suffered a little bit of a, you know, we had these Chinese partners and they, they didn't feel like China was really ready for a, a musical <laughs> and maybe they were right, but uh, we are all very proud of them. And those who- So how did this film go over in China? Well, that's what I'm saying. It, it was, um, it, it's a longer story, but our Chinese partners, uh, Hawaii Brothers and uh, Shanghai Media Group, they basically said, we don't, we, in order to sell this movie, you need stars. Cause this is back in 2010 ish mm -hmm. and only stars could sell movies in China's box office had not like completely blown up the way it has now. And they yeah. said, we need stars. So they kept recommending that we form a music group among these actors, take them on tour. And then at the end of the year say, oh, let's um, guess what? We have a movie now with these actors. And Disney said, no, we're, we're selling the brand, High School Musical. So at the last minute, they kind of dropped the project. So it was up to Disney to, to, to market it at the last minute. And so it was, a, it was not the best situation. But those who have seen the movie, who <laughs> love this genre, are very appreciative of the movie, as am I. I can't and wait to see it. Yeah, it was, um, it, was, it was difficult to know how to enter the marketplace. The yeah, time. yeah, interesting, very interesting. Then right. um, after that, I made a movie. It was a romantic comedy called Shanghai Calling with the writer-director Daniel Xia. And that was also mm -hmm. incredibly fun. We shot, I mean, I feel so lucky. I've shot in Shanghai four or five times all over on the bunt, like places that are considered very difficult. So starting with Empire of the Sun, we basically closed down much of Shanghai. <laughs> we shot on the bund. Uh, Drilla Club was shot on the bun, Shanghai Column was shot on the bun, High School Musical was shot on the bun, and all over. I mean, this movie was on locations all over Shanghai, and I couldn't have been happier. We It was a co-production, and um, but we had little interference on both sides because it was very... It was a, a very lighthearted film. And yeah, I was uh, pretty, pretty damn happy. That's great. It's movies. a great movie. <laughs> um, so yeah, so let's run through because we're getting close to the end of our time. Oh yeah, so so 
things started, you know, there was a, a period where there were a lot, there was a lot of talk between filmmakers back and forth. And um, I were uh, under the auspices of Asia study, I chaired something called the US Asia Entertainment Summit. And primarily it was with China and every year we'd bring over different Chinese filmmakers. This year it was obviously Feng Xiaogang, but we also had uh, Zhang Yimo and Xu Zhang and Lu Chuan and you know, all these top Chinese filmmakers would come over and it was a, a period of very robust conversations between financiers in Hollywood and China. And so we'd have this amazing gathering of people like we would honor heads of studios here, but also top top uh, heads of studios in China. And there was fantastic, uh, just, you know, courtship and, and Again, sometimes engagement. cross-cultural connection. And incredible cross culture Year after year, we got amazing people together, but, Obviously, 2019, uh, 2020 pandemic, we, we did a virtual thing last year. Yeah. And things are, the, the environment is very, very different, both here and in China. And we have yeah. to figure out whether we can actually pull something like this off, right. sadly. So it's not the end of the story. Yeah. And you never yeah. know the end of any story, yeah. but it's it's a bit of a pause button for now. But um, yeah, it's it's it was so wonderful to have this cross-cultural activity and third yeah. Third, what I call third culture community. Yes. Um, yes. So, so rich good question about Feng Xiaogang. Um, he's, I mean, in, in my mind, I know him as making these hilariously wonderful, funny movies. So is he funny in person? What's he like in person? He's he's actually kind of droll. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> he's kind of, he's kind of um, I, I feel like with a lot of films, like Xu Zhong came over a couple of years ago and he's also so funny, right? But but a little bit droll in person, but very thoughtful. You can tell they're always thinking. So I don't think they just willy nilly, you know, I, I had met for instance, several times with Robin Williams. He couldn't turn it off. He was just nonstop funny. Right. Interesting. But, but these that, directors yeah. they think are very thoughtful. They're very yes. profound. So it's not like they're spewing jokes right and left. They're, right. they're, they're pretty intense actually, but you know, yeah. always have something interesting to say, an interesting commentary. Yeah. So a couple of final questions for you, because we're getting to to uh, we've passed our time already. But uh, so you reconnected with Wang Keping um, many years later, right? Two, so a little two bit about years that. ago, I was in Hong Kong at Art Basel. OK. OK. And I noticed there was an exhibit of his sculptures. I was like, what? I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Is he here? Is he here? And he wasn't in, in that booth at the moment and like come back at a certain time and he wasn't there. And then apparently he came and I was like, but finally, finally it's like right before I was leaving to go catch a plane, which I ended up missing by the way, <laughs> thanks to him. <laughs> um, he showed up and we're like, oh my God. Oh. And it had been, you know, I hadn't seen him since 1981. Yeah, yeah. And, that's, and I can yeah. only imagine because those connections. And he amazing. had, one of those pictures was actually hung at the exhibit. Oh my gosh. And he had a lot of, he had more photos than I did. Oh, that's and wonderful. yeah, and you know, there's so many other people that have come through or friends and friends that that period was truly unique and incredible. And I thank the Chinese artists for, you know, giving me the life that I have. I'm so choked up thinking about it because oh. I didn't dare dream about it until yeah. then. It was not, it was not even in my consciousness that I could be doing what I'm doing. Oh, that's so beautiful, Janet. Wow. Um, so final question for you. Uh, why is film a great way to know China? Um, and oh, what are some of your favorite Chinese films? Yeah, it, it's, it, it's, it's live. It's real people moving, talking. I suddenly flashed to, and I think it's appropriate because I've talked a lot about the fifth generation filmmakers as well. It didn't end there. You know, there's the sixth generation filmmakers so one of the films that I remember seeing with just such also brought this, it's, it's, it's a feeling I can barely describe as sort of, you're, it's so gratifying, but it's um, called Beijing Bicycle and it's, yes. it's uh, by Wang Xiaoshui. Oh my God. And I remember, I mean, it's a simple movie, uh, but it, it touched me so much. I went to see it in a theater and it was just, uh, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was about, it was like these scenes of people riding their bicycles through the hutong of Beijing. And, and it was just a simple, but such a touching story. And it got inside the humanity and it got, it broke a shield for me uh, that is rarely broken of like, you know, and to this day, you know, in, in fact, today we have, again, many, many shields and people are not willing to penetrate 
what you know the very superficial things that we read in the media which are not untrue but it's it's hardly the full story right and most of which talks about government policy and this and this and that and focuses on trouble areas and i yeah. i just what what i lament is that there's very few opportunities to see the humanity and i think I think, and that's what I tried to do with say a movie like Over the Moon, which was easier yeah. to make because it was animated. And I still feel that people who are able to watch Chinese films and go back and see a movie, a movie that that um, Feng Xiaogang was actually in that he didn't direct it was called Lao Pao, you know, Mr. Six. Mm -hmm. And it's an incredible movie about a, a man played by him and his son who his, you know, whose life is going awry, you know, and, it, and, and anybody who's a parent or a child would would relate to this movie because yeah. it's so emotional and, and you yeah. know, so I think finding those universal themes and being able to do it with, with as, what I feel like is a, a dehumanized version of China <laughs> in yes, these yes. days, you know, yes. is, is a way to kind of flip the coin and see, oh, get underneath and say, what are these, what are their actual experiences? What's happening? Another right. movie I might mention is the documentary film, um, 87, oh my God, 67 Days. Did I get the number wrong? Which is a, a, about the very, very, very early days. It was by Wu Hao and it's the very early days of the pandemic. And oh, it was yes, raw, raw, unvarnished footage of what it was like for healthcare workers in yeah. this period, working at hospitals with people banging down doors to try to get in. And yes. it, it's just so, and the, the care that they gave their patients and calling their family members if someone yes. had died, it was, it was so moving. So yeah. that that's what I like to see. Um, yeah. Just, just a, a more fully, uh, you know, this is what we strive for in all of our work is, is yeah. characters that are fully fleshed out. Yeah. And that's what I love about uh, a number of Chinese movies that I really highly encourage people to yeah. see. Janet, thank you so much for sharing you're that. Welcome. With us. And you're welcome. You, you so much, you are speaking to our heart at China <laughs> because that is so much what we're striving to do is to bring humanity into the conversation. Um, because as you said, there are so many shields now that are blocking that conversation about what is shared about our humanity. So really, thank you so much. And I know we could all listen to you. Yeah, for sorry hours, we went very long. But thank you, we're way past our time. Yeah, but, sorry, but, sorry. Uh, I no, I want to thank you so much. And thank you to our audience for joining us. And I do want to quickly encourage you to become members. Um, the, the way to do that is in the chat box um, on this, you know, which you'll find on your screen. And you know, it not only gives you great benefits and all that, but most importantly, it brings brilliant speakers like Janet Yang to our programs. Um, so, and I also want to ask you to please tune in to our Food and Ideas Festival, which is coming up in a couple of weeks. The link for that is also in our chat. Uh, we're going to bring you conversations uh, and food demonstrations about everything from the new farm to table movement in China to global influences on Chinese cuisine in Hong Kong and Taipei. Uh, so check out our website for also, also we've got on our website um, some, some uh, great information about our favorite food films and food document feature films and food documentaries, uh, which we're going to be, uh, you know, putting out on social media. And this conversation also will be out on social media. So, so tune in for all of that. And I just, Janet, I want to thank you again so much for helping us tell the story of China. Thank you for having me. We're really thrilled. We have to get you back soon. Thank you, Janet. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.